Mr. President, distinguished members of the Constitutional Council of Cameroon, I greet you. I come here this morning with a very sad and heavy heart. Sad and heavy because I see a beautiful country of mine self-destructing. And I see very intelligent and knowledgeable people letting it slip between our fingers. My name is Ikomingongi, Mbela Ikomingongi. I live in Boya, one of the centers of the devastation that this country is experiencing today. I have been a lawyer for 40 years. But in the few years that I have spent in Cameroon, I have seen more diverse devastation that I ever imagined to see in my own country. I come here with a background that is almost unique to many lawyers in this country. Because most of my work has consisted in rebuilding countries that have been devastated by war and conflict. In Cambodia, in Burundi, in Rwanda, in Congo Democratic Republic, I have worked in all those countries trying to rebuild destruction that was caused by neglect of attention to a people's needs. 20 something years after the, diff the conflict in Cambodia, people are still nursing these cars. In 1996 and 1995, I was in Burundi investigating the devastation that resulted from the 1994 massacres. The people of Burundi have not yet recovered. The same in Rwanda. In this panel here, Mr. President and honorable members, you have a distinguished member who served in one of the courts that addressed the many problems that resulted from the problems in Rwanda. She can tell you her experiences and what she saw. The other day, I said, left Boya to come to Yaoundé for these sittings. I drove through at least five checkpoints manned by military people and policemen. They opened your trunk of the car, checked your papers, checked your ID cards, all the way to Miselele and all the way to Yato, where you have close to the bridge, and to Bekoko. I never felt so alienated in my own country so insecure and so unprotected. But the moment I crossed Bekoko and I got to Bundaberry, it dawned on me very sadly that we are really living in two different countries. In Bundaberry, in Aqua, in Bundaprizo, as I drove on, I saw people who were free going around with their daily businesses, totally oblivious of what people were experiencing in the southwest and northwest regions of this country. They lived as if they were in a different country. But, but, in spite of all of this, this country, this government, went on to carry on elections as if they did not know that part of this country, which constituted about 25% of the population, which contributes a bit more than 40% of the GDP of this country, were totally marginalized and not part of the mainstream. You may want to ask, how did we get here? It did not happen overnight. This is a festering wound that began in 1961. I was a small boy then in primary school, and I have lived part of the history. But just in case one may think I'm biased because I am living in this part of the country, I will take the liberty 
to read to you transcripts of records of discussions that took place in the House of Parliament in London on the 1st of August 1961, two months before the so-called reunification. These discussions took place at 1.21 a.m. and they're recorded in volume 647 of a Hansard. A certain member of parliament, Mr. G.M. Thompson, from Dundee East in Scotland, raised the problem of southern Cameroons to parliament. This is what he had to say, amongst many other things, recorded in a 17-page document. I will just read excerpts. And I quote, the problem of uniting these two territories would, in any event, be difficult. There are two territories of completely different cultures with different political systems. There are extremely complex problems in bringing these two countries, these two countries, together within one national state. So far as I can discover, no serious work has been done on joining these countries and getting down to the hard problem of bringing them together. So far, only a number of very general declarations have been made about the kind of framework that might be proposed. In these circumstances, a potentially very dangerous situation has arisen. That was 57 years ago. First, then, is a question of a kind of government that is to be set up. There have been a number of statements from the Prime Minister of Southern Cameroon, Mr. Foncher, and the President of the Cameroon Republic, Mr. Hijo, that they have agreed in general terms that the best form of government will be a federation. There can be no doubt that given the difficulties facing the two countries, with their different systems of administration and their different languages, federation is the only practicable, practicable system, certainly in the interest of inhabitants of the southern Cameroons. But there is no sort of clarity as to how this is a definite commitment on behalf of the Cameroon Republic under President Nahijo. I know that in the Republic of Cameroon, Many voices have been raised to express a very different and much more alarming point of view. If the House will bear with me, and this is Mr. Thompson talking, not me, I will talk French for one sentence. I understand that le 1er octobre, on va saisir le Cameroun du Sud, unquote is a familiar slogan in Cameroon Republic. I am wondering what our government... I am wondering why our government are doing to try to ensure that there is a firm agreement in black and white that there should be a proper federal system which will allow the two territories to work out their future. Mr. Thompson, in conclusion, went on to say this. Despite the tremendous difficulties in both Cameroon Republic and in the southern Cameroons, the possibility through bringing about a union between the two territories are considerable, not only for themselves, but for the kind of example which they can set for other African territories in the future. If it is possible to bring about a peaceful and progressive union between the French-speaking and English-speaking territories, the old arbitrary boundaries of the 19th century proconsuls will be wiped out and will get new countries established in Africa which will take better account of the feelings of African nationalism. Now, Mr. Thompson concludes, this is a very, a very late stage at which to try to do the right thing in southern Cameroons. In a real sense, it is the 11th hour. 
But, and he continues, I plead with the government that although they have neglected so many things, they should act even now before it is too late. That is the ominous warning of a man who did not even know us. How is that relevant to the issue we are before us today? It is very relevant. Because today, we come here in a desperate attempt, in the last and desperate attempt to try to save this country from self-destruction. The Anglophone crisis in the North and Southwest problem, provinces or regions have the potential of destroying this country, of destroying the vive ensemble and the unity that we so pro easily proclaim. Oh, but in case some of you may not see what I see, let me try to give you a face of this conflict. Just now, my colleague Boris Okungo talked about the difficulties in moving around during election day. On Saturday morning, I was with the DO of Boya in his office. I obtained my laissez passe to move around to coordinate the, 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 the supervision of the electoral polling stations. On Sunday, as I prepared to go out, I heard that that same DO, who was fully protected by soldiers and policemen, had been shot on and wounded on the arm. He's now in hospital. If a DO so well protected could not move around freely, how would you expect the ordinary citizen to go around and vote? But that is not all. Mr. President, it is not a secret to all of you sitting here today that there are 20 plus thousand refugees from the southwest and northwest in Nigeria who have not been able to vote. It's not also a secret to you that there are more than 300,000 internally displaced people who have left the northwest and southwest regions and run over to Yaoundé and Douala and other places in fear for their lives. It is not also a secret that because of the terror these people face every day in the hands of the so-called Ambazonians and in the hands of the military and security forces who are supposed to protect us, people are afraid to go out of their homes. Let me give you a bit of face to this. Last week, a young man named Mbame Ekwa, who lives in Bova, a village in the outskirts of Boya Town, was suspected by the Ambazonian boys of colluding with the government. He was given two options, to kill him or to cut his, his arm. He gave his arm and his right arm was cut off. Two weeks, three weeks ago, a little girl, 20 years old, named Akemnem Bernice, who lives with the chief of British support, Chief Monano, was crushed viciously right by the Bokum petrol station in Great support by an unmarked white pickup truck driven by policemen. And they went away. Nobody knows about what happened to that child and the family. A few months back, four boys were shot in Great support. Three of them were taken to be killed on the way to a corner. On the way to a corner at the dump star where the high circum drops their garbage, one of them spoke French and he was promptly released. The other two were shot and dumped in the dumpster. It's a boy who ran back to the village to tell the village where their brothers and sisters had been dumped. I could go on and on with this picture. But I may ask your indulgence for one minute. Just to close your eyes and imagine that any one of these people were your brothers or sisters, your sons, your daughter, your friend. Just close your eyes for one minute and imagine that and tell me if you will be in a position to go out and vote. Tell me, how did we get so insensitive that one part of our country is burning? And we're here talking about votes. 
when the very, very existence of this country is at stake, when do we become so insensitive that the interest of one person being in power is more important than the interest of 20 million people? I will dare any of you to come back with me as I drive to the Southwest region, to come along with me without your police escorts and see the reality we live. To see the empty village of Moya, the empty village of Ekona, the town of Moyuka totally deserted, the empty village of Munyenge burned down. Come and see my 16, a bustling suburb of Boya, dead. Mutengene, a graveyard. Then come to Boya. Drive up to Moliko, you don't see anybody. Drive up to Bonduma. On the day of the polling, of the voting, there were three people who voted in the police station in Bonduma. Three. I'll not be surprised if you have records that show 3,000 voted. This is the picture I wanted you to see. Is it under these circumstances, Mr. President, distinguished members of this Constitutional Council, that you expected elections to take place in the Northwest and Southwest regions? Go to Ngembu and Batibo. Go to Bikom. Go to Ndop. You will not see people living in their homes anymore. One member of this Constitutional Council had his house burned down. His only crime was that he belongs to this council. He was appointed by the government. It has become a crime now on both sides of the, of the conflict to be suspected as an Ambazonian or to be suspected as working with the government. In the middle of this conflict are hundreds of thousands and millions of innocent people who pay an unnecessary price for the neglect of our history, for the neglect and the attempt to obliterate our history. Our history is one which has not been respected for 57 years. You have, you have your excellences, the opportunity to correct that history today. What I call upon you to do is not to examine laws and sections of the laws. It's to examine your consciences. Because the conscience of judges forms a very important part in decision making and in rendering of justice. You have a wonderful and unique opportunity of a lifetime today to save this country from the impending doom that I so sadly see looming in the horizon. Thank you.